let's do a couple more examples with triple integrals. So here we have uh, a solid cone of height one with base radius one, and we wanna find the centroid. And I am gonna have you set this up in just a second, but just so that we're all talking about uh, everything oriented the same way, let's place our cone so that it's sitting like this here. If this is my X, Y, Z. And so we have the base radius is one and the height is one, which means this is one right here. And then when I come down the radius, this is one. Okay, so go ahead and put it on pause. We need to remember what a centroid is. Uh, and before you set it up, I want you to make a guess as to where the centroid's gonna be and then go ahead and put it on pause and see if you can calculate it. Okay, so a reminder, what is a centroid? Centroid is defined as the average X, Y, and Z location uh, over a region. And so in this case, we're gonna do this entire cone and its interior, which we'll call E. And one way we can get to the centroid is by just using the center of mass, assuming that density is constant. So let's let our density be a constant value, and then we can just write the equations for the center of mass. And I want to point out how these simplify if my density is constant. So if I replace the density here with this constant k, and I could do the same thing here and here and here and here, and notice that means that I can bring this constant out front of each of these integrals, and then it'll cancel out front there. And so it's basically going to simplify oops, to just this. I brought it out front and they canceled. And this is back to exactly what we defined as average value. So we'll just remember, recall, if I wanted the average value of some function f over this three-dimensional region, it's the triple integral of f over the volume of the region. And so in this case, x bar is really the average x y bar is the average y, z bar is the average z location over this region. Now before we go and set it up, I want to point out that we don't want to do triple integrals if we don't have to. So I'd say at this point you want to look and see which ones of these can we figure out just from symmetry, which ones could we figure out just from geometry, and then we're only going to do the ones that we can't do either way or either of those methods. Okay, so I'm going to jump to the next page. So by symmetry, you should be able to argue that x bar and y bar are going to be zero because we're asking for the average x and y location of the cone and inside the cone as well. And so z bar is really the only one we're going to need to calculate. And the denominator of z bar is asking for the volume of the cone. We can just use geometry for that. We know a volume of a cone is one third pi r squared h. So that volume is just pi over three. Okay, so really all that we need, we have left to calculate is this triple integral in the numerator. And because of the symmetry of this cone about the z axis, and because the shadow of the cone is going to be a circle on the xy plane, this is screaming out to us to convert to cylindrical. So if you haven't already, put it on pause and set up the bounds for what this should be in cylindrical coordinates. Okay, so I already gave a hint a little bit with that arrow that was shooting through in the picture. Um, the arrow, that purple arrow in the picture is really here to help us figure out our Z bounds. And so uh, first, so my integrand just is Z, from this, my dv becomes r dz dr d theta. And then to get my inner bounds, I shoot an arrow for a constant r and theta. So just parallel to the z axis and see where it enters. In this case, it's entering along the cone, which is 
z is equal to r, and it's exiting along the plane z is equal to 1. And if you were thinking, wait, how do I know that this cone has the equation z equals r, we can just sketch a cross section of that cone in the zr plane up here. And because we said that the radius was 1 and the height was 1, that means this is sitting all along the line z is equal to r in the zr plane. And technically, oops, technically the zr plane, I, I only want us to do positive r because that's really all that we allow r to be in cylindrical and polar. Uh, but this would help you see how you could get a different equation if your cone had a slightly steeper or more shallow slope. You can just sketch what it looks like in the zr cross section and then figure out the equation. So this is z is equal to r. All right, so that's my lower bound here, and then it exits along this plane, which is z is equal to 1. Then I need to look at the shadow on the xy plane uh, to figure out my r and theta limits. And notice, because this is, we can look at where these intersect. z equals r and z equals 1 intersect when r is 1. So I have the circle of radius 1, that's the shadow, which is supposed to be that down there. And then to get my r bounds, I shoot an arrow radially outward and look at where it enters and exits. So it's entering or starting when r is 0, exiting when r is 1, and it goes all the way around 0 to 2 pi. And now I can just go through and do the calculation. And it's just some algebra, nothing too crazy. Once I get to this point, I realize that I can decouple this double integral because these bounds are all constants here. And because the integrand can be written as a product of a function of r times a function of theta. And then we end up with 3 fourths. So at the end of the day, my centroid is 0, 0, 3 fourths. OK, and let's try one more example. So this one, I'm going to give you the setup in Cartesian coordinates, and then I want you to convert it to cylindrical, but you don't need to evaluate. So to do this, you are going to need to actually sketch the region of integration, figure out what the solid is that this describes the volume of, so that we can then convert. So go ahead and put this on pause and try it. OK, the good news with going between Cartesian and cylindrical is that the z limits will be the same, or excuse me, we've defined z to be the same in both. So I can just re keep these bounds exactly as they are, but just rewrite them in terms of cylindrical. So my lower limit is just going to become negative square root of 4 minus r squared, and the upper limit is positive square root of 4 minus r squared. And so that's going to give us the top and bottom of a sphere. And we will, we will plot this whole thing in 3D at the end. But it's OK if you can't picture the whole 3D piece, because um, really what you need to be able to picture are, is the shadow to figure out these next two bounds. Because these z bounds are going to stay the same, uh, basically the same in terms of Cartesian versus cylindrical. You just need to rewrite them in terms of r and theta. Okay, so the shadow, here's where we're going to get the shadow. I'm shooting an arrow parallel to the y-axis anywhere between x is 0 and 2. So that's what I have happening here. And this tells me it's going to enter the region when y is 0, which is right here, and it's exiting along this top square root of 2x minus x squared. So I need to see what that is. And you can see as we simplify or as we expand this out, this is actually a circle. And to see exactly where it's centered, uh, we need to complete the square. So we can see this circle centered at 1, 0, and it has a radius of 1. Now, I've just all I've done is translated this region here based on these Cartesian limits. And now I need to switch them to polar. So I'm going to re-sketch the same thing, but now shoot my arrow radially outward. So shoot the out arrow radially outward from the origin. And you can see that 
my r limits will always start at zero and they're always going to exit on the circle so i need to rewrite this circle now in terms of polar and the easiest way to do that is just to solve it here and i will point out there's one more step in here that i kind of just skipped here i could factor out an r and then i get r minus two cosine theta is zero so technically i have two solutions i have either r is zero which is just the origin, or r is 2 cosine theta. But notice 2 cosine theta also includes the origin as a given point if I let theta be 0. So I don't actually, the, this, this solution encapsulates everything. I can trace out the entire curve. Uh, if I let, oh, excuse me, theta doesn't need to be 0. Theta needs to be pi over 2. Because when theta is 0, I'm going to start over here, right? r would just be 2. And then by the time I come back to theta being pi over 2, I will land back at the origin. So that's going to help me see my smallest and largest theta values. And we're going to put this all together and get my new integral. I do want you to still picture what this region looks like in 3D. Uh, this lower and upper limits are part of a sphere centered at the origin of radius two. So let's plot the whole thing together. We basically can imagine that you're gonna allow this um, semi, or yeah, the semicircle to extend up in the Z plane towards us, but then it gets capped above by part of the sphere and below by another part of the sphere. So let me sketch it for you in 3D. Okay, so here's the region just in the xy plane. This is the shadow of the region. And here we're looking down on it. That's why it looks a little bit warped because now I'm about to show you the 3D where you can see the top and the bottom of this region is coming from part of the sphere of radius two that's centered at the origin. So basically, if you think of that entire sphere, we've just chopped up a portion of it where the shadow is lying in this little circle. Oops, where the shadow becomes this little circle. I think you can see that. Yep. Okay, so that's what we did. And we just rewrote this region, this volume, in terms of cylindrical coordinates instead of writing them in Cartesian.